And I'm very delighted that the MPhil and the David Landis are actually running this conference, which is very timely. And we've had a very good start with the panel so far. Um, I'm delighted the University of Dublin, Trinity College Dublin, is supporting this conference of, on academic freedom, which as uh, the head of sociology told us is a very important issue. And we want to thank the university, the dean, uh, Professor Daryl Jones, and Richard Leigh, the uh, head of the, head of the department, and David Landy, um, for um, running and supporting this conference. We'd like to thank all the speakers for coming from various countries, far and wide, and of course to all of you for being here with us, and we hope we have today and tomorrow a very interesting um, discussions. The last conference, the first conference we actually did about Palestine was run in 2007, and it ended up in a collect collection called Thinking Palestine. There was never any question of the university not supporting it. In fact, the university was very delighted that it was happening. I think the climate has changed, but despite that, this, the university has, is supporting this conference, which is wonderful. Now, I particularly have great pleasure to welcome our keynote speaker, Stephen Seleta. Stephen is known to you all because many of you have uh, read his wonderful posts on Facebook and elsewhere. He's an American <laughs> scholar, <laughs> author, and public speaker. And he's a former Edward C. Chair of um, American Studies at the American University of Beirut. And he became a center of controversy, as you, some of you have heard today, on the Pat Kenny show, in which I think he conducted himself extremely well, despite Pat's um, goading. Um, he uh, became a center of controversy when he, the University of Illinois withdrew a conditional offer of um, uh, employment as a professor of American Indian Studies after attention was drawn to some tweets that Stephen had tweeted during the appalling assault by Israel on Gaza in 2014. One thing I thought uh, he said very well to Pat Kenny today when Pat asked him what is the lesson you've learned? Should one not tweet about important things? And Stephen actually said no, when you really believe in something you should fight it because we are, none of us are just academics we are human beings, we are political beings, we are social beings, and we have to stand by our conscience. <clears throat> Stephen is a very prolific writer. Although he's very young, he's published already eight books, and I'll mention some of them. His uh, first book, Anti-Arab Racism in the, in the USA, where it comes from and what it means for politics, was winner of the 2007 Gustavo Myers Center for Study of Bigotry and Human Rights, Outstanding Book Award. He then had a book called The Holy Land in Transit, Colonialism and the Quest for Canaan, a book called Arab American Literary Fictions, Culture and Politics, a book called The Uncultured Wars, another book called Modern Arab American Fiction, A Reader's Guide, another book called Israel's Dead Soul. His last two books are particularly interested, interesting for the topic of this conference. And Civil Rights, Palestine and the Limits of Academic Freedom was published in 2015. And his last book, Internationalism, Decolonizing Palestine and Native America, was published last year. It's a particularly interesting book. I recommend it all to you because he shows in it that the decolonization struggle is actually international, where Native Americans are fighting for Palestine and Palestinian intellectuals are fighting for Native American decolonization. <coughs> In a recent article he published about his experience in Beirut, Steve wrote that he didn't expect Zionist influence to reach Lebanon, where, as you know, Israel has conducted several wars, where it occupied part of Lebanon between uh, 1982 and 2000, and where it, uh, the last assault was in 2006. But Zionism clearly reached the uh, American University in Beirut, and um, appoint his appointment was terminated, though he was not over tenure which is why he now decided to take a bit of a break from Academe, and I hope it's not too long, because Academe can do with people like Steve, and I hope that the right job will be found. For the time being, he's going to write more, and we all are going to enjoy it very much. Steve's talk this evening is called, or is titled, Freedom to Boycott, BDS and the Modern University, and he'll speak for about 40, 45 minutes, and we'll be happy to answer uh, questions afterwards. And uh, give you, um, ladies and gentlemen, I'll give you Stephen Salata.
<coughs> Let me see, is, is my voice coming through okay without being too loud or obnoxious? Okay, uh, please, please let me know if that it changes. And, and I'm talking about volume and not content. Um, so, um, a, a few things before I, I get going. Um, I, I, I want to offer a, a very warm and heartfelt thanks to the, to the many folks who organized uh, to, to, to not only to bring me, but to put together this, this conference, which um, has, has been a mighty success so far and, and, and should continue to be so tomorrow. Um, I encourage you, if, if you have the time and or wherewithal, to, uh, to, to, to check out the panels tomorrow. There's a really, really interesting um, slate of speakers and, and topics, and everybody since I landed here early yesterday morning has been remarkably kind and hospitable and and tolerant of my idiosyncrasies. Even, you know, when I this afternoon I disappeared to take a nap that uh, I announced to nobody, and uh, you know, so they they've, they've had to put up with with a, a, a lot of uh, you know uh, maybe bizarre behavior from me. But in it, but I guess also what I'm trying to get at is that. Um, it, these, these kinds of conferences require a, a ton of, of labor, and they come with a ton of stress as well. Um, you, you have to navigate a bureaucracy and politics, and then there's the nitty gritty of putting out a call for paper and papers and organizing the panels and getting people transportation and, and lodging. And so the, the speakers at these conferences, uh, they get the the attention, but it's it's really the the organizers of the the conference who who deserve our, our thanks and and appreciation. So um, I, I I recognize the the work that they've done, um, and Ronit in particular has has just been uh, lovely to meet. She's been inspiring us uh, for a long time now. Um, her her work has been critical. So it, and 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 her her warmth as a human being um, are are. are Things that that um, that we're lucky to have a chance to to cherish and that we ought to appreciate. So I'm going to kind of be speaking off the cuff tonight. Um, this increases the chance that I'm going going to be stuck up here without anything to say, but it also increases the chance that I'm going to say something offensive. So um, for <laughs> I didn't want to prepare comments. Um, I'm I'm tired of. of Preparing comments, I, I think that sometimes it becomes more interesting, if, if precarious, to, uh, to 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 sort of sketch out what it is that, that I want to discuss. And I know these topics well, um, in in ways both good and bad. But for those of you who are here to uh, report back to the uh, Israeli embassy, you know, be sure to keep your tape recorders rolling, okay? Because you don't want to take a bathroom break and miss that 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 one quotable thing that that I'm going to say. And I want to start with with my first formal, a little story about my first formal introduction to um, Ireland. I took the red eye over from D.C. and it was about five in the morning when we landed and we were going through passport control and it becomes my turn, I hand over my passport and you know the man asks me business or pleasure. And I, I long ago quit trying to, uh, to lie or deceive when I'm trying to get across borders, um, first of all, because I'm a terrible liar, and everybody always knows when I'm lying, and second of all, you know, I, I, I've decided that I want to, to stand by what it is I believe and what I do. And if good consequences come from it, wonderful, if, if bad, then I'm ready to accept those as well. So he asked business or pleasure, and I told him both, um, which, which I consider to be the truth, and of course he said, okay, well, the business part of it, uh, what are you here for? Well, I'm here for a conference, and what's the conference about? So I told him the conference is about Palestine and, and academic freedom. And so he raised his eyebrows, and he, he became interested all of a sudden. And so I'm thinking, okay, here we go again. Right? Uh, let, let me go ahead and, and, and start thinking about uh, faking some addresses to give, and, you know, uh, yeah, you know, they're... they're, they're you know, I, I should have taken the, uh, the the address of the Israeli embassy and said, "Yeah, I'm staying here. Go take it out." You know, um, but uh, and so he smiles and he says, "Oh, okay, that's that's interesting." Um, you know, what year was the Oslo Accord signed? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, 
1993, I believe. That's correct, he tells me. <laughs> you know, what was the first country to recognize the Palestinian passport? And so, I said, in a hundred years ago or now? And he said, in modern times. I told him, I don't know. And he said, Japan. I don't know if he was correct or not, but uh, I, I went with it. And this goes on really for about four or five minutes. He's, he's asking me these kind of questions, of, it's just trivia questions. And, and, and I, I was like, what the hell kind of interrogation is this? You know, I've never, you know, I've, okay. Um, you know, and, and then he stands my passport and he hands it back and he says, you know, I think what you're doing is wonderful and, and I, I hope you have a great visit and a great time here and, and, and keep up what you're doing. And so I left, just kind of blown away. And I thought, okay, this isn't representative of the entire country, right? But it, it's certainly a nice welcome in keeping with the kind of reputation that, that Ireland has among the Palestinian people and those who are involved in Palestine solidarity activism. And then, of course, because it was five in the morning and I didn't have much better to do, I kept on thinking about it. It occurred to me that what happened was an anomaly but it shouldn't be an anomaly. That's what it should be like when we cross borders, when we make appearances in this world, when we're interacting with authority figures, important or small. Why is the supporter of Palestine, of justice, of equal rights, of compassion, very simple things, always on the defensive, always in a tenuous position, always made to feel ashamed, and anybody who works on Palestine knows what I'm talking about. You encounter that inevitable moment where you know you're going to be asked and you have to prepare yourself right, for some sort of response that makes you feel implicated for your beliefs or that makes you feel as if you're doing something wrong or that makes you feel as if you are a threatening human being for the simple fact that you are supporting the freedom of a group of oppressed people. Why should the supporter of colonization, of ethnic cleansing, of apartheid, be so confident, so assured of safe passage in this world? And these are questions that we need to keep thinking about and asking ourselves. Why are we always, those of us who care about Palestine, those of us who care about human rights, who care about our fellow human beings, why are we never able or so rarely able to access a normative position in this world. And this is a problem that goes well beyond North America. This is a problem that exists in the Arab world as well, where being Palestinian or being devoted to Palestine can get you the same type of ugly encounter at Arab border crossings as it can in the US and Canada. Well, for one, Zionism accords to state power. When you reinforce the interests of the ruling class, you don't have to explain yourself. You don't have to take an accounting of your beliefs. You don't have to justify why it is you do what you do. It, that hassle, that luxury, whatever you want to call it, belongs to the people who stand in solidarity with the powerless. And it's always in these moments we're parsing who's the more powerful party and who's the less powerful party that this comes to fruition and it becomes a universal rule. That when you choose to stand with the less powerful party, you have to make an accounting of yourself. Pardon me. And here's where academic freedom comes into play. Academic freedom isn't meant for those who cause no trouble by virtue of their obeisance. It exists to protect intellectual mischief. It exists to pr protect those who engage in controversy or have the potential to create controversy. Nothing the world over is as mischievous as a principled devotion to Palestinian liberation. The world over, that's an issue that can get you shunned, that can get you fired, that can get you arrested, that can get you in all sorts of trouble. 
This is why a marriage of Palestine and academic freedom, such as we're, we're discussing tonight and in the conference more generally, is a topic so rich in possibility. And I want to spend a, a few moments exploring those possibilities. Let's start with academic freedom. What is it? I indicated already that academic freedom is there to protect controversial ideas, but that, that's a pretty narrow reading of what academic freedom has been, what it is, and what it might be in the future. Quite simply, universities cannot function the way that they are supposed to without a strong, without a strong system of academic freedom. Academic freedom means that professors, students, anybody associated with the university can publish comments that anger a powerful party without the threat of recrimination. It exists because there is no such thing as intellectual advancement or for that matter scientific advancement in this world unless we encounter a moment of discomfort. We don't grow without discomfort. And if we're not allowed to stir up people's discomfort, particularly the discomfort of the powerful or those who identify with the powerful, right, then we become mired in a sense of sameness. We don't progress, we don't advance, everything stagnates. Well, this is quite how those who benefit from the existence of injustice would like for the world to be. They would like for it to stagnate because the way that the world is currently constructed suits them just fine. They're doing quite well. They don't need any changes. But for those of us who are interested in exploring the full extent of, of our humanity, who are interested in, in playing around with, with, with cherished ideas, with sacred ideas, for those of us who are interested in being recalcitrant, who don't want to play by the established rules, Right? whose very sense of intellectual labor consists of upending platitudes and consists also of directing people's attention towards things that are systematically suppressed in the world at both a local and a global level, then academic freedom ensures them, in theory, the ability to do that. We have a system of tenure in, in North America that, that's comparable to what exists here in, in Europe, but the entire reason that, that, that tenure exists in principle is so that, that professors can engage in, in, in public discourse, so they can be political beings so they can express opinions on Twitter or otherwise, so they can pursue controversial ideas, or so they can allow themselves to reach conclusions that might upset somebody who has the means and the ability to retaliate. Without the system of tenure, protecting our ability to do these things, the assumption is that the retaliation is going to win out. And that's why tenure, tenure exists, in other words, to protect academic freedom. Long-term contracts exist in part to protect <coughs> academic freedom. Well, okay, this is all well and good, but think about the kind of assumptions that, that underlie the existence of, of, uh, of a, a system of tenure, a system of protection, in other words. It's based on the assumption, a well-founded assumption, an assumption that has been proved true over and over again, right, that universities, like any other institutions, can very much be hell holes of repression. And that they have functioned that way right, in nearly every country right, at different points in time, and that's certainly true today. Academic freedom, like any other social contract, isn't applied equally. In other words, some people have more academic freedom than others. <laughs> some issues are considered safer than others. And I've known, I've known a lot of, of clever 
academics through, throughout my adult life who are, are well aware of exactly which issues to discuss and which issues to avoid. And one thing I've seen consistently in the US, in Canada, in Lebanon, elsewhere, is that the one issue any smart professor who wants to avoid controversy knows to avoid is Palestine. You do not touch Palestine. It's toxic. It's toxic because we have seen over and over again people being punished for articulating viewpoints or opinions that run afoul of the Israel lobby, as it's called in the US, or that, that run afoul of those devoted to sanitizing and whitewashing the state of Israel. Anti-Zionism is a particular source of trouble. This is, this is true in Ireland, this is true in the United States, it's, it's true almost everywhere. Because anti-Zionism is not simply an opposition to Israeli policy, it is opposition to the very ethnocratic ideal upon which Israel was founded. It is also anti-Zionism when done correctly in conversation with anti-colonization, anti-racism, anti-sexism, anti-imperialism. It is there as a broad principle of a liberatory politics that is global in scope. That's what a principle of anti-Zionism does. And these are the sorts of things that are generally unwelcomed by administrators on university campuses. I can't speak to Ireland, and I always get nervous when, when I, I speak in, in countries that, that I can lay no claim to. Um, and, and, and I never like to, to discuss local politics, so excuse my Americentrism for, I just made up that word, uh, <laughs> US centrism, I, I don't even know what it's called, I, my, my Yankeedom. Uh, for, the, the, the next moment, but there are certain things, topics in the United States that are always going to get you in trouble on university campuses. One of them is criticism of the police. Another is criticism of the military. You criticize the U.S. military and, and you're, 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 you're asking for a backlash. It's an easy target for uh, the, the right-wing media demagogue machine that, that is so prominent in the United States. I, you know, in, in, entire uh, right-wing media channels are devoted to, to, to sniffing out people who express inadequate patriotism. Another is structural racism. It's okay in the U.S., encouraged even, to condemn individual racists, to condemn the buffoon at the neo-Nazi rally, right, who's, who's carrying a, a rebel flag or who uses the N-word, right, but it becomes much dicier if you start looking at the way that racism exists institutionally in the very structure of the United States and the way that it exists in supposedly cultured and genteel places and the way that the formation of the society itself constantly is reproducing that structured racism. Right? This is where you get into trouble. Criticizing capitalism gets you in trouble. And then, of course, Palestine. Right? In the U.S. alone, we have literally dozens, I would say it runs into the triple digits, of cases of people at universities who have lost their jobs because they became targeted for, for their anti-Zionism or for their support of, of Palestinian human rights. I'm, I guess, one of the more prominent I examples, and there are a lot of factors that sort of went into to my story touching a, a nerve, and I can talk about it in the Q&A if anybody is interested, but um, I, I'm, I'm certainly not the only one. It, it has happened to Jews, it's happened to Arabs, it's happened to Christians, to Muslims, right? Uh, it's happened to black folks, to white folks, you know, it, it, it's happened across the board. And this, and, and I always try to emphasize this, these things are documented. Right. Uh, uh, people have put together databases and, and, and studies of, of how this suppression has functioned and who, who it has affected, but it doesn't take into account those who never got a job in the first place. Right. There you're talking about a whole lot of people. I have a lot of Palestinian friends and colleagues who never even get a screening interview. Not only because of, of their politics, but very often because of their names. 
And I have never been, and I've, been, I've never been to a campus visit, a formal day-long or two-day-long interview for, for an academic job. I mean, you know, this is the thing. Academic jobs are, are it's a rigorous process. You know, it, it, it takes, a, it, it's a lot of headache getting one of those positions, right? From the application point to the point at which an offer is proffered. But um, I've never been to a campus visit. And I've been probably to, to dozens at this point in my life um, where the resident liberal Zionists on campus didn't come and peek at me as if I were a medical curiosity. <laughs> always. They always turn up at the, at the coffee break, at the meet and greet, at the dinner, and I always know when I leave. Always know. Right? That they're running off to the dean right now saying, this man made me feel uncomfortable. I do not feel safe around this man. This man is a threat. And that is why, one reason why I was so surprised to have a perfectly normal, right, even, even a kind of stupid argument, a, a, a stupid conversation at the passport control in Ireland because we are so unaccustomed to being treated vapidly like any other human being, but always as a threat, always as somebody who has to present our civility as some kind of credential to even enter the public arena in the first place. And so I've just described in very broad form a systematic repression of the Palestinian people and of the Palestine Solidarity Movement in academe. And so I would turn it around and ask you to name the cases of professors who have been fired because of their advocacy for Israel. I'll give you the list right here. Let me write it out for you. <laughs> that's, that's the list right there. There's not a known case of this sort of thing happening. And I've heard pro-Israel academics say, no, 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 this sort of thing happens. Get out of here. Come on. Right? Because if such a thing were to happen, it would be on the ABC news feed. It would be on CNN. It would be everywhere. And even after my story, uh, my situation with the University of Illinois had, had I guess, b become a, a controversy that people were discussing. Corporate media would not touch it, and they still won't touch me. They'll write about me, right? but they will never, ever, ever let me present a point of view in my own voice. Right? And so I've abandoned them altogether. It's a little bit silly, like, you know what? No, I reject you. You don't get to reject me, right? Uh, but, but there is an ethic behind it also, and it's that those of us who are involved in Palestine solidarity work don't need to beg for inclusion in spaces that are inherently and necessarily hostile to us. We don't need to, pr pr we don't need to produce our human credentials. Our human credentials exist in the very politics that we support. So the problem is not ours. The problem belongs to those who see settler colonization somehow as something respectable, as something that doesn't need to be questioned, something that can be supported as normative. So I made an allusion to the controversy at, at, at Illinois over the tweets, and of course Pat Kenny asked about them. Um, everybody asks about them, and, and I mean, it's okay, I, I, I understand why. Um, but it was interesting, in my two years in Beirut, um, I, I didn't really have to talk about them and think about them much, and so once, uh, towards the end of my stay in Beirut, I, I went back to the U.S. to give a talk, and I was with a, a meeting of the, the, the faculty somewhere in the Pacific Northwest in Washington State, and, um, and, and they, they, they kind of undertook an interrogation, uh, literary criticism style of, you know, like, they gave a close reading of my tweets. Like, what did you mean by this word? I meant fuck. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, it's, it's spelled out right there. Like, uh, it's, uh, it's really not a mystery. Do you know, uh, you know, it was, it was kind of like that. And, and it all kind of came rushing back to me. Um, and, and it was at this moment, uh, I, I can't even explain it. We were sitting around a big conference room, and, and I felt like, and, and I felt like I was at a tribunal being judged. 
And, and I hadn't thought about them in a long time, that, that Illinois thing. And, and it is really something I don't even like to talk about. It, it, something that I wanted to, to kind of put behind me to the extent that it was possible. It all sort of came rushing back. You know, everybody online discussing my tweets, me um, having a gag order, not being able to talk. Um, you know, after it had happened, you know, I hired a lawyer, and the first thing the lawyer tells you is keep your mouth shut. All right, and then that keeping my mouth shut ended up lasting almost three months, and so I was sort of reading a debate that was about me that I couldn't participate in, and it was incredibly frustrating. And all those feelings sort of came rushing back to me, and, and it occurred to me in that moment, I was like, holy shit, those tweets have come to define me. To, not to my family, you know, not to my close friends, not to my comrades in Palestine Solidarity, right, who, who you know, um, I'm, I'm forever grateful for, for their kindness and their friendship, right? And, and the fact that they care about me as a human being and not as a subject of controversy, but they define me. And so I started thinking more about it because that's what I was trained to do as, as an academic, and, which is usually a bad idea, but in, in this case it led to something good. And I realized that's, that's exactly how it is with colonization. That's exactly how it is. The native is always understood in relation to the unease that he causes the settler. The settler is never defined by the violence he inflicts upon the native. So I'll always be defined by my tweets, not simply because it's of tabloid interest to people, but because those who ended up getting me fired, those, in other words, who ended up harming me, they produced the harm on me, not me on them, right? have made it a point to continue beating the drum of disrepute, of incivility, of all of these unsavory characteristics that I can never get back unless I prove my humanity. And this is a game that, that Palestinians, that Arabs more broadly, Muslims more broadly, have come to understand very well over the past few decades, the past few years in, in particular. So let me talk for a second about, about those tweets and about academic freedom and about BDS. Um, I, I don't consider myself um, a, 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 a mean or, or an angry person. Um, I, I, I think, I honestly think, uh, to tell the truth, I think Pat Kenny was kind of shocked when, when he met me. Really, I thought that, that he, 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 you know, he was kind of taken aback that I didn't come in crawling on my belly, you know, and I kind of, kind of you know, screaming obscenities, you know. Uh, it's just like, oh, you know, okay. You know, he doesn't have facial hair. You know, uh, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was kind of an aha moment. And, and, no, and I, I can tell. I can tell when I meet people. And, and then they're, they, they're like, well, he's not what I expected. And in fact, people tell me that. Oh, you're not what I expected. Well, I, you know, you, you should quit reading about what Zionists have to say about me, right? Uh, because if something Zionists tell you about the world, it's never what you expect, right? Because they always tell them bullshit lies about the world, all right? Don't listen to them. Don't let them make you up your own mind. Make your own decision. But I'm... I am shy and I'm introverted and I, I, it, it's very difficult for me to get up in front of audiences and talk. Um, I've, I've learned to, to do it and I've learned to, to enjoy it, but um, I, I don't mess around when it comes to Palestine. There's no compromise with me when it comes to freedom for Palestinians. And I've run afoul of folks in my own community, in the Arab American community, and the so-called Palestine Solidarity community for criticizing big name uh, uh, speakers and advocates like Norman Finkelstein and Noam Chomsky and, and, and others for being soft or weak or hostile even on right of return, you know, BDS, other things. But my mind and my heart are always, always <laughs> with the people I've known inside my family and beyond who have suffered the deprivations of, of the Israeli state. And it's their interests and it's their consciousness that, that I always attempt to represent. And I've never, ever heard a Palestinian in a refugee camp, whether it's in Jordan, in the West Bank, in the Gaza Strip, in Lebanon, I've never heard a refugee, whether it's a four-year-old or a 90-year-old, say, such nonsensical things as, Israel will never accept the right of return and therefore we must abandon it. So if a famous Western writer with a big platform and a big name makes that statement, 
then somebody needs to jump in and say, hell no. Because we do not make Israel and Israeli public opinion the default of what we will accept and what we won't accept. And when Israel goes on a killing spree, yes, I said killing spree, and I say it without hyperbole, such as it did in Gaza Strip in 2014, we condemn it. You can condemn it using curse words or not curse words, but it is to be condemned. It is in no way to be rationalized, to explain the way, to turn into a debate about both sides or, or any other uh, 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 colonial nonsense. All right? It is to be condemned. And that's what I did in the summer of 2014. I couldn't say this when I had a lawsuit ongoing. You can't really say anything when you have a lawsuit ongoing. And, and one of the reasons I ended the lawsuit is so I could say whatever the hell I want. You know, I don't regret a damn word that, that I said. I would condemn Israel just as harshly today. I will condemn Israel just as harshly tomorrow. As long as Israel continues to take Palestinian land, as long as Israel continues to throw children into prison, as long as Israel continues its systematic, deliberate program of ethnic cleansing, I will not compromise in my critique of the state. And I would suggest that nor should you, that you don't need to reach a point of respectability with Western audiences. Think about what you would say to the people in Palestine and whether it would be acceptable to them. And what is acceptable to them is inherently hostile to those who control public opinion in the West. But that's a decision that you have to make. Thank you. So I was, I was angry in the summer of 2014. I was angry. And after the incident happened at, at Illinois, and we can, you know, you can send out tweets. So think about it. Have you ever send out a tweet thinking, okay, like 5,000 people are going to be close reading this? Do you, do you know what I mean? You, you send out a tweet. It's, it's kind of a, a, a medium that happens in the moment. You, 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 don't, you, know, you don't expect it to, to, um, you know, uh, to develop a wide readership. Right? <laughs> you know, it's, it's, just, it's just not the nature of the platform. But um, I sent out the, 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 the tweets and then. Um, all of the judgments rolled in, and I promise this is important to academic freedom, or it's supposed to be anyhow, you can decide whether it is or not. And I, I, I started, I was always bristling at the description of me as, as, as angry, which was technically true. I was angry when I sent the tweets, there's no doubt about it. But I, I didn't feel like that described me as a human being. And it seemed to be racialized somehow, you know, as a, as a, as a quality in, in, inherent to a certain kind of person and inherent to a certain kind of, of culture, like anger was, was, was my totality. And, and it, was, it was kind of, I don't know, it was kind of hurtful, painful to, to, to sort of process, you know, uh, being viewed as, as a particular kind of monster, you know, a, 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 a hateful person, a, you know, a, 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 a person who would wish uh, hate and, and harm upon others, but, I finally got to the point, and I'm telling you this story because I, I, I know that other people in this audience struggle with similar things, and, and I hope that in some way it can help you get to this point, where I quit apologizing for the kinds of reactions I was having against stark, horrid injustice, that in fact it was okay to be angry. In fact, Anger was the most human emotion that one could have expressed in 2014. It was not only perfectly appropriate, right, but it was, a, all of the anger that we were expressing was a sign of compassion and a sign of empathy and an articulation of a kind of hopelessness that we all felt as we saw those pictures of dead children over and over again, rolling through our social media feeds. And then I thought more about it. Well, yeah, what else am I supposed to feel? You know, black people in the US are always described as angry. Always, black women particularly. Always, that's the trope, that they're angry. They're angry, the angry black woman, you know, on and on and on. And, and it's like, well, when you see a video of the police roll up on somebody, 
slam him to the ground, put their knee in his back, put a gun into his head, choke him to death, or shoot him, point blank, what the hell else are they supposed to feel? Are you supposed to feel joy? Are you supposed to be happy? What other emotion are you supposed to feel other than anger? When you see pictures from Gaza of toddlers and little children being stacked into ice cream freezers, their corpses, what other emotion is there other than anger? What other emotion is there? And this is one of the problems with how our public discourse is regulated. It's regulated in a way to always proffer comfort to those who are sympathetic with the parties who are producing these sorts of horrors. We're not to make them uncomfortable. We're not to make them second guess themselves. We're not to who express our anger. Because expressing our anger, first of all, reinforces the racist perceptions of who we are in the first place. And second of all, indicates to those who don't want us that we are not equipped with the cultural know-how to assimilate into their modern societies. And it's a, it's a self-perpetuating process. But if academic freedom cannot protect shows of emotion, then it's useless. If it cannot protect strong condemnation and strong criticism, not only of governments around the world engaged in violence, but criticism of those who earn very nice livings, whitewashing that state violence, then academic freedom is useless. When I go back now, many years later, three years later, over three years later, and read those tweets, and think about them in the context of what happened, or what was happening at the time in Gaza, I still get stunned that it generated the kind of outcry that it did. And it's really a rather remarkable thing. And everybody always asks, about the tweets, and nobody asks about the Israeli destruction. It's as if, like Palestinians and Arabs and Muslims are said often to do, right, that I just crawled out of a vacuum and started on, on, on an irrational discourse of, of, of Jew hatred and anti-Semitism. Right? That my very existence as a discursive creature, as an emotional being, Right, as, as an intellectual subject, right, were to irrationally hate. And that there could be no context that could adequately explain why one would be displeased with the behavior of the State of Israel, because the behavior of the State of Israel never comes into the equation. And again, we always have to put the narrative back where it belongs. We cannot allow ourselves constantly to be put on trial for our own humanity. The questions belong to Israel, and Israel's the one who has to answer right, to its ability to access humanity, not those who stand in solidarity with those constantly harmed by the Israeli state. Academic freedom has always done a poor job of protecting discourses that are considered uncivil by sites of power, and I, and I elaborated on them earlier, anti-police, anti-military, anti-capitalism, and so forth. But we don't really understand academic freedom also if we respond by trying to detach it from politics. That we need to think not only about academic freedom as an institution, right, as, as, as something that, that exists in theory as a protection, we need to think about how academic freedom shifts and changes according to the politics that it's attached to at any given moment. Because academic freedom looks very different when it comes to Palestine. Very different when it comes to, to racism and to Black Lives Matter and these sorts of things. So, for those who are doing Palestine solidarity work and who, are also, who also have academic careers or aspire to an academic career, I don't think it's helpful in either the short term or in the long run to produce a narrative that, that tries to, to, to sanitize academic freedom as something that is, is sacrosanct, outside of or beyond politics. That we need to say, yes, um, 
academic freedom needs to be protected, but, but the survival of academic freedom in and of itself isn't the point in the end. Right? The, the, the point right, is the issue of justice that we're attaching to academic freedom in the first place. For me, the point is the liberation of Palestine. That's the goal. Academic freedom is a means. Academic freedom is supposed to keep us soluble right, while, we, uh, while we work towards that goal. Right? But the preservation of academic freedom right, is contingent on an acceptance of the continuation of suppression. We want to end, right, ideally, and I know it's impossible, but ideally, we want to end the conditions that make academic freedom necessary in the first place. Attach it to politics. I'm going to go ahead and, and wrap up. I've been yammering for a long time. Um, I, I appreciate you humoring me. Um, this, this, I hope, gives us enough time for, for, for questions and comments. You feel free to ask me about anything you like. I'll do my best to, to give you a satisfying answer. I don't, don't know whether I'll be able to succeed, but just a, a few final thoughts. Um, it's my contention that as long as it fails to protect everybody who's supposed to exist under its umbrella, that academic freedom is, is, is largely a myth. It exists, it sort of exists, but it doesn't fully exist. And if it doesn't fully exist, then, eh, you know, it, 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 it's, it's, it, it, it has a tenuous position in our academic institutions. So basically I'm trying to say, if there's no academic freedom for critics of Israel, then there's no academic freedom. As long as there's no freedom for Palestinians, then we have to continue giving guardians of injustice a reason to suppress. If it's not turned toward revolutionary ends, then there's no re reason for academic freedom to exist. As a closing thought, I would suggest, I, I humbly suggest that when we undertake projects of, of BDS on and off campus, and, 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 and you know, we, we, we've been really successful in doing those sorts of things over, over the years, and, and you know, uh, inshallah we'll continue to be successful at them, but um, when, we, when, we, when we undertake these actions, and university administrators come to question us, or or, or pro-Zionist or pro-Israel activist groups, you know, come to question us, or when we start getting criticized on, on, on social media and elsewhere. I think the most useful way to respond is with the ethic in mind that those who are undertaking the inquest need to explain themselves to the people that they are endeavoring to suppress. And that we do have somebody in our work to answer to. We do have somebody to answer to. And those people do not exist in suits and ties in administrative offices on campus. Those we need to answer to or playing with their toys in refugee camps. Those we need to answer to are those who rely on us in the West, wherever it is we're in the world, right, to represent their aspirations for freedom and not to satisfy the discomfort of those to whom Palestinians are inherently a threat. I'm going to go ahead and stop, uh, and thank you for your time, and I'll go ahead and, and take questions and comments. <laughs>